You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. If a thing exists, someone somewhere is beating off about it right now. Balloons, swim caps, toothbrushes, toasters, socks, galoshes. Our erotic imaginations are voracious and unpredictable and random as fuck. There is no predicting what they'll latch on to. If a thing lives, someone somewhere wants to fuck it or be fucked by it. And a quote-unquote living thing doesn't even have to exist to be the object of someone somewhere's desire to fuck or be fucked by it. Aliens, dinosaurs, angels, 50-foot-tall women, centaurs, there are people who want to fuck them all. And Bigfoot, too. There are people out there who want to fuck Bigfoot or get fucked by Bigfoot, as we were reminded this weekend. Leslie Cockburn, a Democrat, is running against Republican Denver Riggleman in Virginia's 5th Congressional District for an open seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Riggleman, the Republican, has refused to disavow Corey Stewart the neo-Confederate, not-so-crypto white supremacist who somehow managed to win the GOP nomination for the U.S. Senate in Virginia. Stewart, who has been endorsed by Trump, is so far to the right, which is cable news polite speak for so fucking openly and baldly racist, that the National Republican Senatorial Committee hasn't endorsed him. Denver Riggleman, however, has refused to say whether he'll be voting for Stewart or for Tim Kaine, the incumbent Democratic senator, and the former and kind of lousy VP candidate. And when Riggleman was asked whether he would campaign with Stewart or continue to campaign with Stewart, a man who thinks that anti-white bias is the real racism in this country, Riggleman would only say, it depends. Stewart's nomination for the Senate in Virginia, the nomination of a racist who grew up in Minnesota and won't shut up about his Southern heritage, that was news, but it wasn't big news. Maybe because he's not the only avowed racist nominated for office by the GOP's oh-so-economically-anxious base this year. As Jane Coaston reported at Fox earlier this month, in at least five state and national races across the country, the Republican Party is dealing with an uncomfortable problem. Their party's candidates are either a card-carrying Nazi, a Holocaust denier, a proud white supremacist, or all of the above. White supremacists and Nazis have received the GOP nomination in Illinois, Wisconsin, California, North Carolina, and Virginia. At this point, it's hardly news when a racist white supremacist or a card-carrying Nazi wins the GOP nomination. Their wins and the willingness of GOP voters to support these racists and Nazis is quickly becoming a dog bites man story or a dog sea hiles man story. So it wasn't enough for Leslie Cockburn, the Democrat again, running against Republican Denver Riggleman. Wasn't enough for her to point to Riggleman's willingness to pal around with white supremacists like Corey Stewart. A GOP candidate being a white supremacist barely makes news. We've already got one of those in the Oval fucking office. But Riggleman is in the news this week, and we're all hearing about him now because Cockburn tweeted this out late Sunday night. My opponent, Denver Riggleman, running mate of Corey Stewart, was caught on camera campaigning with a white supremacist. Now he has been exposed as a devotee of Bigfoot erotica. This is not what we need on Capitol Hill. A devotee of Bigfoot erotica? No, 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 no. An author. Riggleman co-wrote the as-yet-not-released book, The Mating Habits of Bigfoot and Why Women Want Him a book he promoted on Instagram with a censored image that emphasized Bigfoot's superhuman and super hairy endowment. Within minutes of Cockburn's tweet, Bigfoot erotica was trending on Twitter, and the following morning, news junkies got to read this hilarious paragraph in the Washington Post, and you're going to want to stick around for the parenthetical statement that comes at the end. Trust me. Here we go. The Bigfoot genre, a subset of pornographic literature called cryptozoological erotica, was in the news a few years ago when Amazon.com and other online booksellers began deleting so-called monster porn from their websites. Critics complained that the books featured rape, bestiality, and pedophilia. Some authors responded by changing their titles, toning down their descriptions, or labeling their stories adults only. Amazon currently lists dozens of e-books with titles such as Shiver for Yeti, Where the Wild Things Ravish, and Bride of Bigfoot. 
Parentheses, Amazon.com founder and chief executive Jeffrey P. Bezos owns the Washington Post. Riggleman denies the book is erotica. He describes it as a practical joke. But the candidate should release the book and let the voters in Virginia's 5th Congressional District judge for themselves. Is the mating habits of Bigfoot and why women want him sexy ha-ha or sexy fap-fap? Let the voters decide. What is neither funny or sexy, of course, is that we know Riggleman's name. We know about this race now all over the country because he wrote some Bigfoot erotica. Not because he's been palling around with white supremacists. That, of course is the real scandal. And we should not lose our capacity to be scandalized by the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists, and the Holocaust deniers that the GOP base is polluting ballots with all over the country. That is the existential crisis we face now. And that, not Bigfoot porn, is the real scandal. And speaking of books, today we turn to The Good Book, where we find something with the help of a guest that might disturb people who describe the Bible as the good book. Spoiler alert, there's an abortion in the Bible. God approves. Coming up, that's on the micro and the magnum this week on the Lovecast. Hashtag open and inclusive sex positive community for adult exploration built around a dating app has started rolling out their beta in Seattle. The first batch of community founders have been giving the app rave reviews and have already helped the team quash a bunch of pesky bugs. Sign up at hashtag open.com right now and become a community founder. Let me be me and you be you, which you can do at hashtag open. Thanks to RX Bar for supporting the Savage Lovecast. RX Bar is a whole food protein bar with no BS. Get 25% off your first order at rxbar.com slash savage. And use the promo code SAVAGE. That's rxbar.com slash SAVAGE, promo code SAVAGE. We talk a lot about butt play on this podcast, one of my specialties. But let's talk about keeping your butt clean. Everybody poops, but not everybody cleans their butts well. Enter Tushy, the modern bidet attachment that cleans all the ducky dingleberries and dumps off your butt after every poop. It easily attaches to any standard toilet in under 10 minutes and provides a precise stream straight to your butthole. Tushy gives you a thorough and focused wash with fresh, clean water. And it starts at, everyone's favorite number, $69. Do your ass a favor and wash with Tushy. Go to hellotushy.com and get 10% off your order with promo code SAVAGE. Stop wiping and start washing with Tushy. Hey, Dan. I am a... This female uh, living on the East Coast, 32, been in a relationship for two years, and I have kind of a quick, easy question, probably. I saw a porno not too long ago that interested me, where a guy was going down on a girl using a lollipop, and inserting the lollipop in her, putting it on her clit, looked nice. I'm interested. But I'm also wondering, like, Could that cause a yeast infection? Like, if I go for this, am I going to have some sort of bad health repercussion? Is this safe? Because I'm into it. Getting sugar in your vagina can screw up your pH levels and you can get a nasty, unpleasant yeast infection. So, save the lollipop for before or after. He can eat your pussy candy for your pussy. should be sweet enough for him as is. Don't mess it up by getting sugar inside it. And just as a a general note here, a a general rule, I am opposed, and I require all of my listeners to be opposed to incorporating food into sex, putting whipped cream on somebody and licking it off. It sounds sexy. You've seen it in probably a couple of movies. But in reality, it takes about 30 seconds for the whipped cream to begin to melt, and then your partner smells like a baby puked on them. It's just not sexy. Chocolate sauce, mixing chocolate sauce in with it to change how that dick tastes, it just ends up looking... The optics are terrible. It looks like shit everywhere. It's not sexy in reality. Smearing food all over someone and eating it off is the kind of sexual fantasy somebody who is 16 and doesn't have any sexual fantasies pretends to have so they feel like they're more interesting or they're self-conscious about the fact they haven't discovered what their true turn-ons or kinks are yet so they think about food. Sex may be the one thing we Americans are capable of doing, North Americans are capable of doing, without dumping sugar all over it and food all over it. Let's keep it that way. Hi, Dan. I am a 19-year-old gay man living in Texas, 
And I recently just started dating a guy, and I've normally been a top, never really bottomed. Um, I bought him like twice and haven't been a fan of it. I want to with this guy, and I'm interested in doing it. We've tried a few times, and he is a little bigger, and both times I have been, and he's like super nice and patient with him and everything, but both times I've just been like having to like chill, and like we've done foreplay, and like we tried fingering and everything, but it's just very painful, but I'm like, I'm into it, like I want to keep trying. I was just going to ask if there's any suggestions you have for helping to ease it or get more comfortable with it. Again, like we've tried fingering and everything and like gone really slow and it's just like still is like really hard for me to like take it in. You say you've tried fingering and foreplay. What you need to try is fingering and whatever else you were attempting as anal foreplay as the main event. Anal stimulation coupled with some mind-blowing orgasms can create an association between anal stimulation and pleasure that's important and crucial and can help you get to his great big dick slamming in and out of your ass. If each time your butt has been engaged in play during sex, it was the intent of working his giant dick into your ass, that creates a certain amount of anxiety and tension. And learning how to be receptive in anal intercourse is about relaxing and letting go of tension. His dick makes you tense right now. You want to be on the receiving end of anal pleasure from him, and you should do that without his dick, without his dick. Toys, tongues, that's it for now. Toys, tongues, orgasms, fingers. Go get a couple of butt plugs, stick them in your butts, and then have oral sex, roll around, mutual masturbation, create an association and a powerful one between anal pleasure and your orgasms, anal stimulation, and that kind of pleasure. And that helps. Also, get some different butt toys of various sizes, tiptoeing up to the size of his dick. And use those and play with those. Not with the goal, when you bust out those toys, that in 10 minutes his dick is going in there. But no, no, no. They are the end unto themselves. The end unto your end at that moment. You're going to play with those toys, you're going to roll around, you're going to do other things and get each other off in other ways while your butt and his butt are both in play. And then work your way up to gradually swapping his dick out for the larger of the toys that you two acquired together. Good luck. Hashtag open and inclusive sex positive community for adult exploration built around a dating app has started rolling out their beta here in Seattle. The first batch of community founders have been giving the app rave reviews and have already helped the team quash a couple of pesky bugs. The hashtag open team is adding members to the community at a measured pace to ensure that your right to privacy is respected from day one and that you maintain control over your personal data as the community grows. To that end, they are forming a charitable trust that will have full ownership and control of all user data, ensuring that it can never be used for any purpose other than in service to the community and in support of Hashtag Open's mission to promote a safer, sex-positive environment for all people, especially women and other marginalized populations. And they're going to do all of this through empirically driven research and education around gender identity, sexual orientation, and relationship styles. Go to HashtagOpen.com right now to sign up and to hear about the exciting events they've got coming up. Let me be me and you be you. Hashtag open. We're going to take a quick break from your calls to have a, a conversation with a very interesting person who did a very interesting thing. But first, and I apologize, we try to do this as rarely as possible. I'm going to have to inflict a little bit of the 45th president of the United States on you for context. Do you want to see the court overturn Roe Well, if we put another two or perhaps three justices on, that's really what's going to be, ha that will happen. And that'll happen automatically, in my opinion, because I am putting pro-life justices on the court. Trump, of course, has appointed one justice to the Supreme Court, to Merrick Garland's stolen seat, to Barack Obama's stolen seat of the Supreme Court. And he is about to appoint his next justice, a pro-life justice who will automatically overturn Roe v. Wade. So you, over the next few weeks, next couple of months, probably going to be having some arguments with Trump supporting family members or pro-life family members. And we want to today arm you with an interesting angle on that argument, particularly with religious family members who oppose abortion rights. And joining us to talk about 
something that I didn't notice the three or four times I read the Bible cover to cover is Jesse Kramer, a queer writer and storyteller who grew up in a devout fundamentalist Christian family, came out to his family in 2013, and then sat down and read and blogged the Bible. And we're here to talk about one of his old blog posts because I think it is hugely relevant. And I think it is a shock that I only learned about this reading a five-year-old blog. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Dan. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. Um, so thank you very much for jumping on the phone. Why did you decide to read and blog the entire Bible? Okay. So uh, I grew up in a very fundamentalist Christian household, and I was the second of two boys in my family to come out of the closet. And uh, when I came out of the closet, it was very devastating for my parents to hear this. And so my mom, in the midst of an argument, said, well, just go read the Bible. Just go read the Bible and see what it says. And so I was like, okay, I will. And so I started at the beginning and read my way through the Bible in a year, blogging my way through, just from the perspective of a queer person with a very fundamentalist background, just trying to figure out exactly what the Bible says. Quick, quickly, for people who want to, to find your blog, where can they find it online? What, what's the URL? Yes, yeah, uh, GodDoesn'tChange.com, and it's a year-long blog that I finished in 2014. And I wanted to talk to you about one particular blog post. You, you found reading the Bible that you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of anti-gay shit in there. That's what your mother wanted you to read. Uh, and you, mm -hmm. you read that, you blogged that, but there's something else that I think is relevant to the debate we're going to be having over the next few months about Donald Trump's next appointment to the Supreme Court and the likelihood, the fucking fuck likelihood, the certainty that that will be the fifth vote on the Supreme mm -hmm. Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. And you stumbled over something or you, you, you found something, you read something that's just in there called The Test for an Unfaithful Wife. What book of the Bible is that in and what the fuck is it? Okay, so it comes from the book of Numbers, which is part of the Torah in Jewish tradition. And it, uh, Numbers is wholly uh, just a lot of laws. That's really what it's all talking about there. And in this specific uh, chapter 5, verses 11 through 31, it describes this thing, as you said, called the test for an unfaithful wife. And this is how it goes. If a man believes that his wife has been cheating on him, but, but he has no proof, that what he does is he takes... Uh, her to the priest. The priest takes holy water, dust from the tabernacle floor, and then he writes a curse and then wipes off the curse ink into the concoction and has her drink it. And then there's two possible outcomes. If nothing happens, then the wife is said to have not been unfaithful. She is holy in the eyes of uh, God and their marriage is fine. But however, it says that if her abdomen swells, causing her uh causing a miscarriage then that proves that the woman has been unfaithful and it, it's implied that she would then be put to death because that's another law that's mentioned as well okay but just to to to, to like really draw people's attention to what's fucking going on here this is god's abortificant we're talking about here this is god instructing a man to go get his unfaithful wife an abortion in case she's carrying some other man's child Yes. So that's when I read it and those words that I just described to you, I immediately went, whoa, this is a biblical abortion that I had never heard of. And it's even further than what you think, because it's not a choice. This isn't a pro-choice uh, passage. This is a forced choice passage. It, uh, you, it's, it's a man forcing his wife to have, an abortion. to have uh, an abortion, to have an abortion. Now, I should say that uh, as with anything in the Bible, there's a ton of controversy around what this passage means. Some, some versions of the Bible translate it as uh, the, the curse is uh, the, her thigh will rot. Another one mentions that her bowels will be upset, which, by the way, is also a side effect of medical abortion uh, medications, is, uh, is diarrhea and things like that. So it's just really interesting, and no one can really agree on exactly what it says, but I'm telling you that a lot of people read this and go, this is a biblical abortion. What, what does the original text say? Does it say her thigh will rot or does it say she will have a miscarriage? See, that's the thing. Is it, it's all, this is the problem with going to the word of the Bible is that so often you read, like Jeff Sessions recently quoted the Bible defending that terrible family separation policy that all, you know, we need to follow the laws of, uh, of the government. And that's the problem with whenever you point, pick something out of the Bible and then try to justify it, is that this was written in languages 
uh, and then translated and translated and translated. So, I mean, if you pick up any verse in the Bible, you can get six different interpretations of it. And basically, if one person has one agenda, they can translate it one way. If another person has another agenda, they're going to lean into somebody else's translation. And so if you want my, like, what do you want me to know what, what Moses wrote down for this? I couldn't tell you, but I'll tell you that this is from the New International Version of the Bible, which is the most popular version of the Bible uh, translation. It's read by the most amount of people, and it's the one I grew up reading. But I grew up going to church every Sunday, Bible studies, a couple times a week, never heard this passage, never brought up. I heard anti-gay passages once a month at church, but I never heard Numbers 5 in this test that ends in an abortion. This was never mentioned. There was no conversation about it. What was the reaction to your blog post about it? I mean, you say this is hugely controversial and much debated. How is it that we've been having a debate about abortion rights with religious conservatives for, as since Roe v. Wade, since 1973, and this passage has never come to my attention. If there's a controversy and debate about it, it's under the surface and hidden away. It just, it, it blows my mind that... That the Torah, you know, the Old Testament numbers, it doesn't tell guys to take their wife to Planned Parenthood. You take him to the temple. The temple was Planned Parenthood back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and and how how has this not been the subject of a great deal of attention? Not just debate and controversy in, in, in religious communities who obviously have a an incentive to cover up God's abortificant, God's RU four eighty six, the dust in the <laughs> temple floor, and a little bit of holy water and some ink. How do we not all know about this? Well, see, that's the thing that I've, I found throughout throughout reading the Bible, and this is, goes beyond just this um, entry I made and a lot of other controversial areas that I went into, uh, that people read, they, they read the Bible, they find the translation that best suits what their personal experience is. And I think that what someone can read this and go, you know what, I'm going to go read the King James Version just for this passage, because the King James Version says, her thigh will rot because that that gets me out of this jam that God the priests were the first abortion doctors. Okay, there's so many places in the Bible where this is true. The translation you cite mm-hmm. is considered yeah. to be much more accurate to the original text than King James, which engages in a lot of poetry. There's a lot of poetry in the King James Bible, which was commissioned, by the way, by James the First of England. Huge faggot. So mm-hmm. the, the King James Bible that's beloved by, by so many Christians for its, its poetry and its lyricism, uh, a, a gay man caused that uh, uh, translation to be written. But the translation that you cite, mm-hmm. again, the name of that translation? New International Version. It's pretty much the standard version that I see read in churches across this country. And it's considered to be much more accurate, a much more accurate and faithful translation. Yeah. So if that one says miscarriage, then my money's on miscarriage, not a kind of poetic allusion to a miscarriage, which is what her, you know, a rotting thigh will be. That's just a delicate way of saying a bloody mess at the top of her legs, which is a miscarriage yeah. in this instance, in this context. Sure. Exactly. And I, I want to bring out something else because I was reading through, uh, you know, a lot of message boards where people are arguing about this passage. And then I stumbled upon ex- in Exodus, there is a, a passage that really implies that unborn children are not anything in the eyes of God. Uh, in Exodus 21, it tells us that if um, a man hurts a woman who is pregnant and it, re- it, it results in the baby miscarrying, then he's supposed to pay some sort of fine. However, if he kills her, then he is put to death eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So her life is a true life and is you know, if you kill her, you have to die as well. But if you kill her baby, it's just some money. It's just some money that you have to pay. Mind blown. I was, I was, of course, familiar with that passage, but not familiar with the original Planned Parent doctor was a priest down at the temple. And that's where you went to get your, if your wife was cheating on you, abortion. And, you, you, you know, sometimes you have to accept the premise of your opponents when you I- engage in debate and argument with them. With the whole, like, gay rights, gay marriage debate, sometimes, like, religious conservatives would say, I oppose gay marriage because I believe it's sinful and you're going to hell. And I would say to them, so are the Jews, right? In your belief. And yet you're not arguing the Jews shouldn't be allowed to be married. Can we get the same deal? Sometimes it helps to accept the premise mm-hmm. of, of someone else's argument to defeat them or to, 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 you know, show them the path out. 
uh, from there. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we don't have to debate, I think, abortion rights on religious terms. We aren't obligated to. But again, for people out there who are listening who have family members who whose religious beliefs and religious opposition to abortion led them to vote, hold their noses in some instances and vote for Trump because they wanted abortion banned. I think throwing this little number from numbers in their faces could be really effective. Yeah. And I I also, one point I want to make really clear is that conservatives uh, don't often believe in exceptions to their rules. They think that like everything is cut and dry, hard and fast, but the Bible is all about exceptions. You take, for uh, for instance, uh, you take the thou shalt not kill, you know, <laughs> that command. commandment. And then in Joshua, the commandment, that's one of the Ten Commandments. And then Joshua, just a couple uh, books later, is committing a, you know, a genocide against the Canaanites to take back Jericho to kill man, woman, child, and animal. What happens to thou shalt not kill there? That shows that the Bible believes in exceptions. And we, for some reason, don't think that there should ever be any exceptions for anything. And that's just not at all, that does, that does not square with what I was reading or even what I was, uh, even in Bible studies growing up, you know, I, I constantly came across passages where it's like, well, what do they mean by this? And then some person would go, oh, well, you know what? We don't really follow that per se, but we just understand that it's like certain things we can understand in historical context, but not others. And that just didn't work out for me. The blog is goddoesn'tchange.com. The post where Jesse unpacks this passage from Numbers is Let's Talk About Abortion. Jesse Interprets the Law, Part 12. Just Google that. It'll pop right up. Jesse Kramer, he's a storyteller, playwright, co-founder of the Hot Metal Arts Collective in New York City. He's worked with The Moth, People's Improv Theater, Pete's Candy Store, Bramble Jam, and others. Thank you so much for digging into the Bible the the way you did. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. I think you've blown some minds today in the same way that you blew mine when this first came to my attention. Hey, do you ever have any Bible questions? Call me up. This is a lot of fun. (laughs) Will do. Thanks to RX Bar for supporting the Savage Love Cast. RX Bar is a protein bar made with 100% whole ingredients and no BS. No bad stuff like added sugar, artificial colors, artificial flavors, preservatives, or fillers. RX Bars are made with a few simple, clean ingredients where every ingredient serves a purpose. Like egg whites for protein, dates to bind, nuts for texture, and other delicious ingredients like unsweetened chocolate, real fruit, and spices like sea salt or cinnamon. RX bars are also gluten-free, soy-free, and dairy-free. They come in 14 delicious flavor varieties. Whether you like sweet or savory, chocolate or fruit flavors, there is an RX bar for you. They're an ideal breakfast on the go option and they make great office snacks. I left a box of them out in our office and they all mysteriously and very quickly disappeared. You can throw a few in your bag for the plane, take some on a bike ride or a hike. They make a great healthy conscious snack. I have a box of them in my desk and I snarf one down right before I go to the gym and it helps me get a better workout. Get 25% off your first order at rxbar.com slash savage and use the promo code savage at checkout. That's rxbar.com slash savage, promo code savage. Hi, Dan, the tech savvy at Rescue. I'm in my mid-30s in the UK. I moved here a few years ago after ending a seven-year marriage on the other side of the world. Um, I didn't enjoy sex with my ex-husband, and we weren't sexually compatible at all. And it's only now that I'm single again, I realize how important sex is to me. Um, And I've also gotten off the pill after it being on it half my life, I've now got a copper IUD and my sex drive has really skyrocketed. Um, the reason I'm calling you is about someone I'm seeing now. I didn't date in my 20s. I had long-term relationships and after having a few short relationships here exploring um, my new independent self, I really started being more casual and I'm seeing a few guys at the same time, which has made me really happy. Um, my friends who know about my lifestyle are really supportive except for one thing. One of the guys I'm seeing and the one I enjoy the most is in a long-term relationship and he has a one-year-old child. He's been upfront about this from the beginning. It was on his dating profile and that he's non-monogamous and um, I found it appealing as I don't want to get into a relationship myself right now. He says that he and his partner have been together 12 years and have been non-monogamous for the last eight. And by the sounds of it, though, he does it a lot more than she does. Um, He basically said that because he has such a high sex drive, she's happy for him to get elsewhere and he works two jobs to support them. Um, We've been seeing each other now three months. 
and he visits me a couple of times a week at regular times but rarely spontaneously the sex is the best I've ever had and we laugh and have a brilliant time together sometimes we go out but he mostly comes to visit me at my place my problem my friends have is that they don't believe that his partner knows what he's doing or that if she does she accepts it rather than being happy about it they think he's basically cheating on her as he sees another person as well as me and especially given he's a young child that I should stop seeing him all I have to go on is what he tells me that he's been doing this for years it's an agreement that he has my friends worry about the effect that it will have on the child and I'm enabling this bad and potentially damaging behavior but the thing is I don't feel guilty about it I'm not asking him for more than I'm getting and I'd like to keep seeing him if he did reveal to me his partner wasn't happy or didn't know what he was doing I'd stop it but all I have to go up what he's told me and I believe him I trust my instinct but find it hard to defend myself against my friends who have real doubts about him and I'm feeling judged by them. What do you think? I think you should stop talking to your friends about this guy if you're not running around town with him, if you're not going out with him, if you're not socializing with him, if he has no cause to interact with your friends, you don't need to tell them that you're continuing to see this guy that they don't think that you should be seeing and are guilt-tripping you for seeing. It's often a problem when someone says that they're in an open relationship that the person to whom they're telling that has no way of independently verifying that fact unless they can contact the spouse and ask. And you could make that a condition of continuing to see you if you have qualms, if you are worried, if you doubt him. But it doesn't sound like you doubt him. You believe him. That doesn't mean he isn't lying. A lot of people are really good liars. A lot of people who are looking for sex, that's when they're best at lying. Great liars are incredible liars if it means they're going to get their dicks wet or their pussy stuffed or their asses stuffed or their throat stuffed. So just because you believe him doesn't mean it's true. And if you're worried or if mollifying your friends is really important to you, you can make a call to the wife, a condition upon continuing to see this guy or a visit with the wife. You say they've been in an open relationship for eight years and together for 12 and have a young child. She may be relieved that he's getting it elsewhere and she doesn't have to put out if him getting it elsewhere doesn't take him away from his duties, his shared responsibilities to raising that child. It is not unheard of for people in open relationships to have children and even young children and be sexually active with others. But at the end of the day, this is really no one's business, but yours and his and hers. And the only conceivable way this could hurt the kid involved is if you're a huge distraction and he isn't there for the kid when he needs to be there for the kid because he's off with you, or if he's lying and it all comes tumbling out and he and his partner of 12 years break up. Again, one way to reassure yourself that that won't happen, that that isn't the case, and that's a conversation with his partner. So you want to try butt play, but the idea of it seems a little unsanitary to you. In the moment, you worry. Maybe you're not fresh. I get it. Your butt isn't as clean as you'd like it to be at all times. You may have skid marks or the occasional stragglers hanging on. So, of course, you don't want anyone going back there. Tushy bidet can help. It's a modern bidet attachment that washes your ass completely, unlike toilet paper, which you'll be using a lot less of. 80% less toilet paper, to be exact saving you hundreds of dollars over time. Tushy is great after you poop and even better for pre and post butt play. You'll never have to worry about feeling dirty when you're getting your rump touched, licked, or humped. Think about it. If you got poop anywhere else on your body, would you wipe it off or wipe it around with a dry piece of paper or would you wash it off with water? You'd wash. So stop wiping and start washing. It starts at $69, and you will be more inclined to $69 after using it. Visit HelloTushy.com for 10% off your entire order with the promo code SAVAGE. Stop wiping and start washing like a European. They do it right. Visit HelloTushy.com for 10% off your entire order with the promo code SAVAGE. Hey, Dan. I'm a tech-savvy at-risk youth. I'm a 28-year-old straight cis woman living in the southeast and i have got an inquiry that i'd really like your your input on i've been dating a guy for about a year and he has a daughter um whom when we started dating was about a year old and the mother of the child is pretty mentally unstable and has a history of abuse with my partner mostly around the realms of emotional manipulation but has 
sometimes been physically violent towards him. And he's pretty scarred and traumatized by this and um, directs all of his attention towards trying to keep her calm um, for the sake of his daughter and for bringing her up in a peaceful environment. I've never met this mother um, at the request of my partner to keep his affairs separate. Uh, and I love spending time with his daughter, and I've gotten really close with her. Although recently, the daughter, who's now approaching two years old, has started talking. And in her speech, she's been starting to say my name. Um, when the daughter is with the mother, the mother, once hearing my name come out of her child's mouth, she becomes enraged and doesn't want me around her child. I, this is entirely out of my control, but, you know, the daughter has started talking and some of her words include my name. So I haven't seen my partner's child now in about six weeks. And despite my expressing concern about this to my partner, he keeps making excuses and po postponing me seeing her. And it really sucks and it hurts. Prior to daughter saying my name in front of her mom, I'd see... I'd see her a few times a week just for consistency, um, and it was an important part of our bonding, both with my partner and for the child. So I guess I'm just kind of reaching a threshold where I don't know how much more of this I can take. I'm trying to be patient and supportive with my partner, who I know is in a very difficult co-parenting situation, um, but this preventing me from seeing his daughter to appease the wrath of his psycho baby mama, his kind of gone too far for me. So I'd love to know what you think um, and what you think I should do. Uh, help me out here, Dan. So your boyfriend's ex-wife is holding this kid hostage and throwing fits to manipulate her ex-husband into what? Never having a relationship with anyone ever again? Never having a girlfriend or a wife in the future who will, of course, be a part of his daughter's life and her daughter's life? Going six weeks without allowing his daughter to see you is a short-term triage-ish solution, but it's not a long-term solution because what his wife, his ex-wife wants in the long run is for him never to have another partner other than her. And that isn't in the cards. That's not something that she can request or demand. It points to her being unfit to parent and it, it reveals her to be someone who shouldn't have full custody of this child if she's going to play these kinds of manipulative games using the child as a weapon against her ex-partner and any future relationship he might be in. So you need to say to your partner, I'm happy to be the dirty little secret and hide or be hidden for the next, pick your time frame, an additional three months, an additional six months while you work this out with your ex-wife, which might include working it out in court with your ex-wife. He doesn't have to sue for custody, but he might have to take her to court to have the terms of their custody arrangement hammered out and it made clear that she is not allowed to use this child or not allowed to demand that her ex never be in a relationship ever again and she can't demand that his kid not be in the same room with or in the company of his new partner or future partners. It's a tough situation. He's got to stand up to her eventually. You have to ask yourself how long you're willing to wait. If that eventually means four years, you willing to be hidden like this for four years from this girl, then go. If you talk to him and that eventually is another six weeks while he works this out with his ex-wife or gets himself a lawyer who can work it out with his ex-wife's lawyer, then you might want to stick around. Hi, Dan. I'm a 25-year-old straight female from the East Coast. My husband and I have been together for six years and married for one, and we have a one-year-old beautiful son. So about a month ago, our son handed me our husband's, my husband's phone, and it had a locked photo vault app pulled up. And we had recently made a sex video, and I didn't have a copy, so I opened the app. What I found shocked me to the core. He had raunchy photos of his first cousin on there. I did confront him on this, and he admitted he had been curious about her body and has been for years. And he just happened to find those photos on Instagram, which was true. He doesn't want to act on it, and he says he was disgusted with himself. But I said if he was truly disgusted with himself, he would have deleted them, to which he admitted he probably would have masturbated to the photos again. I know genetic sexual attraction may have a role, 
but this has taken a huge toll on my self-esteem and trust for him. I'm just asking how I should handle this because I feel so angry, disgusted, betrayed, and jealous. First cousins can get married. 26 states and those marriages are legally recognized in all 50 states. First cousins can get married all over Europe. First cousins can get married in Canada and Australia. First cousins, if they can get married just about anywhere in the world, certainly a first cousin can lust after a first cousin and jack off or vibrate off about a first cousin without it having to be some relationship extinction level event for their non-first cousin partner. I think you need to chill the fuck out. Your husband is attracted to someone else who happens to be his first cousin and has long harbored this attraction. And yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's a little squicky. A lot of people have a problem with that. There are websites that defend first cousin marriages because of this prejudice and this assumption that there's something incredibly squicky or incesty about a first cousin marriage. And yeah, it is a close familial connection and a little closer than most people are comfortable with. That said, your husband didn't cheat on you. He didn't get with his first cousin. He didn't hit on his first cousin. What you found in that locked photo vault was evidence of some reptile brain shit that your husband knew was a little squicky and was enjoying privately. And I think you should respect his privacy retroactively and stop shitting your pants about the fact that this was a first cousin that he was lusting after. Charles Darwin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Edgar Allan Poe, Queen Victoria, Albert Einstein, cousin marriages, many first cousin marriages in that list. It's a thing that happens and we should all chill the fuck out about it. My advice caller, yeah, own your squicky feelings, feel the shit out of your feelings and ask your husband to delete those pics and stuff it down the fucking memory hole. And my advice to your husband, change the password on that secret photo vault. Hi, I'm calling in response to the love cast where you told the caller to absolutely not fuck a Trump supporter, that the pussy is on hold if you support Trump. And I agreed with you when I was listening to the episode until I accidentally fucked a Trump supporter. (laughs) I met someone traveling and we had a really lovely kind of extended weekend together and in the middle, he acknowledged and sort of reluctantly admitted that he had voted for Trump. And, uh, you know, he's a thinking person. He's not a racist or a misogynist. And so it made no sense to me. And my instinct was to like pack up my shit and get out of there. But we ended up having some really wonderful conversations about it. And he wrote down a lot of the things that I said. I was able to introduce him to some ideas he just hadn't considered or things he hadn't thought of because he just didn't have access for some reason to some of the information that I was sharing with him. And he shared some ideas with me that I hadn't thought about because I'm looking where I'm looking and he's looking where he's looking. And since then, I've shared a lot of writing with him. I sent him the Tom Nehesi Coast book, Between Me and the World, so he could think about things from a completely different angle, a book that never would have come to him if it wasn't for me. And if I had just turned around and walked out of the house, we never would have had these opportunities to share ideas. And I think he'll take some of them into his life with him and into his world. So it's not an absolute no in some cases. As a general rule, I don't think anyone should fuck a Trump supporter. And I, in this cultural climate, if I were single out there and dating, I would do my due diligence and ascertain whether someone had voted for Trump and continued to support Trump before I dropped my pants in the presence of someone who could vote for that malignant piece of shit. You say that this Trump supporter that you fucked is a thinking person and not a racist or a misogynist, but he voted for a racist and he voted for a misogynist, which makes him complicit in the racism and misogyny that we've seen just pour forth from the Trump administration. Anyway, you slipped and fell and impaled yourself on a Trump supporter. Weirder shit has happened. People have one night stands and impulsive sex with people that they know literally nothing about. And I think you did the right thing in the wake of the realization that you had slipped and fallen onto the dick of a Trump supporter. You had a talk with this guy. You tried to leverage his desire to get at your pussy again, to pry his mind open and shove Ta-Nehisi Coates' book in there to your credit. And maybe you fucked one of the Trump supporters who can be reached through the power of pussy and redeemed through the power of pussy and good for you. 
Individual results may vary, though. I think most people who found themselves in bed with Trump supporters find them not to be of an open mind, not to be people who can be reasoned with or approached, not to be the type of person that you can pry their brain open with your pussy and shove ta coats in there. But good for you that you seize the opportunity and hopefully he feels terrible about the shit bag he voted for in 2016 and he will vote Democratic, straight Democratic ticket in 2018. I think you should make that a condition of any future access to your powerful, powerful ta coats enabling pussy. Hi, Dan. This is about the woman who gained 50 pounds in your last episode. Um, I think your advice is good. And I think doing going to the gym with your partner and cooking better meals with your partner and stuff is all good advice. But honestly, if this person is someone who's had anorexia and who has gained that significant amount of weight in a year and a half, I think it's a little unfair to put that kind of pressure on her, like to just make some adjustments to her diet and gym and she can lose weight. Obviously, she probably knows all of this. Um, this is, sounds like the kind of thing that she should probably work out with a therapist or a nutritionist. I know that stuff can be expensive, but there are ways that you can find it more cheaply or find people on a sliding scale. I just think that sometimes for people who really struggle with weight loss, I think it can be easy to just tell them, well, okay, like you just got to eat healthier and go to the gym. And they know that. Um, and especially if you've had eating disorders, this is the kind of thing that you probably need outside help with to keep you on track and to give you advice and stuff. I think it might put a lot of pressure on her and her boyfriend if she's coming to him and saying like, yeah, stop cooking the pasta and I'll take off the 50 pounds. 50 pounds is a lot of weight. Hi, Dan. Just wanted to give some feedback about that caller who was concerned about her boyfriend not wanting to fuck her after she gained 50 pounds in a year. And I really thought that you missed the mark there, Dan. Um, first of all, she should really check in with her primary health care provider just to make sure nothing physically is going on with hormones or something because 50 pounds in a year is a lot of weight. But it sounds like she's in the throes of an active eating disorder. Um, she was anorexic. She then was basically starving herself and doing extreme dieting right before she met her boyfriend. And now it sounds like she's binge or emotionally eating. So it doesn't sound like just cutting back on fettuccine Alfredo is going to do it. She really needs to seek help for her mental health. And hopefully her boyfriend will be there to support her to see what else is going on with her physical and mental health. That takes precedence over whether or not he wants to fuck her. Hi. I was calling for the woman in episode 613 whose boyfriend battered her during a drunken blackout episode. I was calling because I totally agree with everything Dan said, and I wanted to add two little weights to the crushing burden of evidence that he presented. During your call, he said that your boyfriend didn't remember the incident because he was blackout drunk, and yet he does remember that your hysteria prompted it. I guess he remembers your being hysterical, and then the tape cut out right before his behavior pretty terrible. Also, I'll point out at the beginning of the call, you said you haven't been happy in your relationship for a year. The end. Scene. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. There's something else we want you to give us, and that is your homemade, amateur, hilarious, funny, beautiful, compelling porn. Go to humpfilmfest.com and click on submit to find out how you can be a porn star in a movie theater for a weekend without having to be a porn star on the internet for all eternity. Again, go to humpfilmfest.com, click on submit and make yourself and your friends and your lovers a big part of my next dirty little porny film festival. Humpfilmfest.com slash submit. Follow me on Twitter at fake Dan Savage. Follow Jesse Kramer on Instagram. He is smart. He is not on Twitter at Gaby underscore giraffe. That's G A Y B Y underscore giraffe at Instagram. The Savage Love Cast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with an installment of the Savage Love Cast. Thanks for downloading.